thanks so much, Cassandra, and all the attendants and of course development for giving me this opportunity. Hopefully you can see the slide. Uh, so I work with analytic worms and I'm really happy that uh, all this uh, session has been of invertebrates. And I'm gonna talk about how we use analytics to try to understand body plan and specification and to compare it to other bilaterian animals. So here is really just a cartoon of the bilaterian tree of life showing the big three groups that are, are in, inside bilateria. We have heard of durostomes, like the tunicae that we heard in the first talk, and ecdysosons just now. Uh, so what happens in bilaterians is that they tend to use a region of the embryo, or sometimes a single cell, that can work as an organizer telling other cells what to do, and, and we call this an organizer center. So this is very classically studied in amphibians, such as salamanders and frogs, but it has been found in other animals. Um, in things like Drosophila melanogaster or Cenorbitid elegans, that are the classic genetic models, they use a combination of maternal determinants and then set up the body axis early in the embryo. Uh, but I want to give you the point of attention to the third group that is usually neglected uh, for developmental study, that is Parellians, uh, where not much is known for their specification of the axis. What we know comes from a certain group that is the snails within the mollusk with a particular lineage that we can call it uh, from the D quadrant lineage can act as an organizer to set up the different tissues of the embryo. And this organizer needs to be turned on by the way of the MAC and its pathway, in particular the effector, the dosphosphorylated ERK. So the, what is, makes Sparalian so nice is that they share a common ancestor type of cleavage that is called Sparal cleavage, where the division is, is stereotypical. We can see what the cells are going to be made, and it, a lot of them will make what we think is also an homologous larval stage that can swim in the water column. And even though that they have this very conserved early cleavage in a conserved larval stage, they can make really, really, really divergent type of body plants in the adult, such as this worm that is an annelid segmented worm that it will be very different from a snail. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Sparellians have the most diverse body plants when we look at both larvae and adults, uh, and includes some things that are very, very delicious, like clams and mussels that some of us really like to eat, uh, but includes things that also can make colonies, things that are solitary predators. And in our case, we study the segmented worms that are annelids here. In particular, we use uh, one worm, that is uh, this one, Ovinia fusiformis, and I'll give you the reasons for that. Is one of the main reasons is that it's part of the group that is a sister to the rest of the annelids. So that helps us to try to infer what will be the developmental ancestral mechanisms for annelids, and then we compare it to other sparellians. So one of the first things that we wanted to do is to describe the early development of this worm. So we look at all the way from one cell to the larval stage to try to identify stages where we can like try to find the activation of ERK in a single cell similar to what happens in snails. And as a matter of fact, at five hours post-fertilization, we found a cell that we can determine that is also coming from this D lineage uh, that is active to ERK. And if we use pharmacological inhibitors, we can block this activation of the single cell. This cell that we can name it with a number and with a letter, and we call it four little d as the organizer. What is really interesting is one hour later at six hours post-fertilization remains undivided relative to the rest of the cell. So now this cell for little d will be the ones that will give rise to dorsal posterior tissue uh, relative to the other cells that have already divided at least once. So that creates the first asymmetry of the embryo and that helps us try to predict that this cell might be important to set up the axis of the body plan. So now we have a candidate of a cell and we have a candidate of a pathway. So we wanted to see if there's an effect on dorsal ventral axis specification or on the axis of the body plan. And to do that, we look at the amazing larvae that these animals have. So let me introduce you to this larvae that we call Mitraria. It's like a spaceship with uh, hairy uh, uh, structures. So they use these hairs called cilia to seam in the water column. And as you can see, it's very clear. And it's, this is a lateral view that shows the digestive system with the mouth here towards the left and has a U-shaped gut. So unfortunately for the larvae, the anus is very close to the mouth. Uh, anything that is the right to the anus is what we call the dorsal posterior tissue, including these uh, prominent structures that are called kitty, that are, they can use for defense and can also use to try to keep the buoyancy in the water column. So we have an understanding of the morphology of the larva by different uh, stainings and looking at the microscope. And we can use gene expression also to look at what cells are part of these tissues. And a combination of both of them led us to uh, try to understand the different regions of the body 
uh, and see if the phenotypes will affect any of these regions. So our candidate, of course, was the MAPKNS pathway. So we used inhibitory drugs to block the MAPKNS pathway during the time where the, we knew that the MAPKNS is active in, during the organizer. We removed the drugs and then let the embryos grow until the larval stage where we can see the phenotypes. These are the controls, again, in a lateral abuse, and you can see the structure that it has. And again, what we call those are posterior tissues, anything that is towards the right here from the anus. These are classic stainings like DAPI acting in cilia. And when we inhibit the MAPKNS pathway, what we get is a single opening because they have lost all the distorsive posterior tissue. And this creates this uh, nice little hat of a larva that now is also cannot be able to swim because they need these uh, bristles in order to keep in the, in the depth of the water column. So they don't have muscle either, and we can use particular gene expression markers to see what kind of tissues have been lost. So this gene Cusco is in the anterior part of the mouth here, in the control larvae, and caudal is in the last part of the digestive system that we call the hindgut. And when we block MAP kinase, we see an expansion of guscoid that is telling us an expansion of anterior ventral as a circle. So we call this phenotype radialized. And we see a loss of caudal telling us that they have lost this dorsal posterior tissue. So in analytes is the first time that we show that MAP kinase has a role in the body axis because the previous analysts that have been studied doesn't have that. So we were very happy because then based on the position of a winner, we can compare it to models in all parallels and try to interpret that this might be the ancestral way to set up the organizer in uh, at least both models and analytes. The caveat, of course, and as you many of the developmental biologists know, is that usually BMP and TG beta are the ones who set up the DV axis in the majority of animals. Uh, again, the analysts that have been studied so far, BMP doesn't seem to play a role, but a different TG beta, the nodal activing. Uh, so we wanted to see now that we have this uh, fancy worm to see what we can find. <laughs> Uh, the BMP pathway against a secreted ligand that binds to a receptor, and this, recept this ligand can be uh, targeted by an antagonist that can move it away, and it's usually one of the main ones is cording. Uh, and the main effector is a different protein called SMAT158. Uh, how the ligand and the antagonist play and set up the SMAT gradient is very important to set up the DV axis in the majority of animals that have been studied, but weirdly enough, not in analytes. And the reason for that is was the thought that because the analysts have lost the main antagonist that was scoring, at least in the ones that have the se genome sequence so far. So we recently sequenced the genome of Owinia, uh, the chromosome level, and we found cording. And then we decided to do a screening of the transcriptions that were available. And we look at more than 70 transcriptions, and we found that cording is prevalent in many, many, many species. Only that just by chance, the ones that have been sequenced the genome before, they didn't have cording. This is the expression of cording. These are lateral views of the blastula uh, in a vegetal view of the blastula again. And you see the expression on the vegetal side, including the organizer that I'm showing, just showing you here with an arrow. Uh, the ligand overlaps and some of the expression here in the what's going to be anterior ventral. And what you see is an activation in, in the, of the SMAT that thankfully the antibody works really well in our worm and it's also active in what is going to be the dorsal posterior tissue including in the organizer that i'm showing you here yeah. so that helps us predict that potentially that this, the bmp true smat is important to set up this uh, tissue of the body as well so using uh, things that we can put in the water where the embryos are developing we use a drug that will block bmp and uh, we can overactivate the bmp with the recombinant protein um, and just to show you what happens at the blastula stage, this is a six hours post process anyway, where we can identify all the cells. Again, this is the normal activation of SMAT uh, on the, what is going to be the dorsal posterior tissue. When we block BMP, we lose that phosphor SMAT activation, but we can still identify the organizer because it's the one cell that hasn't divided yet. When we overactivate BMP, you can expect now that we're going to have SMAT everywhere, but we can still find one single organizer. It's not like we get duplication of organizers. And what is really cool for us is that when we block MAP kinase, we lose SMAT, uh, telling us that potentially the MAP kinase is upstream of the BMP. So set it up, trying to get the steps of all the models of what we think is happening in our system. Uh, so 
it was great. We see an effect and we have a response on the embryo. And now we wanted to see what happens and something that we can score as dorsal, uh, ventral or anterior posterior. So we incubated these, anim these embryos at the time where we knew that the MAPK or this MAT was active and we washed it away and then let them grow out for the next day when we can see this phenotypes of the larvae. And again, you can see that these bristles are very prominent. So it's the easiest thing for us to score. Uh, here I'm showing you acting in black and nuclei in cyan. And as you can predict, if BMP was important when you block it, uh, you should lose dorsal posterior tissue. And we see a loss of that, potentially mostly of the, that structure that has the, the kitty. And when we overactivate the BMP, we get more dorsal posterior tissue telling us that it is, it is potentially the BMP has a very important role inside of this tissue. Usually they only have around five of these bristles, if you have kitty, and now you can see that they have multiple, multiple, multiple. So thankfully, I can tell you that we now are creating a model for our system that we can try to extrapolate to other analytes where there's a cell that is active by map kinase that can act as an organizer, as we see in Molos. And now Eric tells BMP, I did my role. Now it's your turn to set up and finish the job of establishing the dorsal posterior tissue of the embryo and eventually of the larva. Uh, a lot of the names, as you know, are very familiar and they're across many, many species. Uh, and what is interesting for Sparelia is that everything seems to be compacted into a cell and the immediate neighbors, and it seems to be very convenient. And it's a strategy that has been working out for more than 500 million years in this group of animals. Uh, and now, hopefully, you can see also that analysts are not that weird and that they can also use MAP kinase and BMP as the other bilaterians use it as well. And potentially we, we can hypothesize that those analysts that have not used BMP anymore may have been because they have lost uh, this important antagonist cording. And now they have switched it to use nodal activing to set out the body axis. With that, I'd like to give you three main messages. That is, you no, know, Winia for us is a very critical species that we can use for trying to un, uh, answer these developmental mechanisms of the ancestral world of Sparellias and compared to other bilaterians. We're setting out a model of how this organizing can work through MAP kinase and eventually BMP to set a, a big important part of the tissue that it will be the dorsal posterior tissue. And lastly, how important is that we continue sequencing the genome of new animals so you can better understand how is the impact of the loss and gain of gene families, such as cording in the case of animals. And with that, I'd like to thank the members of my lab, uh, Yan and Osiang, and I worked together for the map kinase pathway, Piper, and now me and a great master student, Imran, are working together in this BMP story, and we'll be happy to set it out to the world very, uh, very shortly, hopefully this year. And with that, I'll have, take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Alan. This is really uh, interesting. And uh, as you said, uh, I mean, unexpected as always, based on what we know about before, but news for an analyst for sure. So one of the things that comes to mind for me is Awinia, I always think of as, you know, an unusual analyst in terms of its early embryogenesis because it cleaves spirally, but then uh, gastrulation is very deuterostome-like. So do you think that it, what, what do you think, how do you think we should incorporate that information when interpreting this system? Should we think of this as a putative ancestral spiralian system or could Owenia be showing us things that it shares with other bilateria but aren't necessarily going to be so representative, let's say, of other analytes? And so right now, yeah, we're playing on a story similar of, of what you guys have done, for instance, of interpreting the egg and the cleavage in the context of the entire film and other spiralians. But what we see, at least for Winia fusiformis, is that the development is uh, very protostomic and the blastopore will make the mouth. Uh, and the invagination that we see in Winia, it happens in other analysts that have equal cleavage. Uh, oh, no kidding. Yeah. So at least in, within analysts, we have found that in, for everything that is reported, there's those ones that cleave symmetrically, they will mm -hmm. go undergo invagination instead of a pivoli. As, Interesting. Uh, so it's, it's, okay. it seems in that, and hopefully, eventually, we can find another equal cleaver where we can try to find cording and smart, then we can also compare yeah. the, the, with what we see in Owenia is more spread out throughout the film pattern. Can I ask a question about that? Um, do we have a hypothesis as to what's ancestral for analytes, uh, equal or unequal cleavage? We believe it is equal. Um, so within the group of Winia, we have another family, and maybe here in this street I can see you. So this mm -hmm. other group or clay uh, also have equal cleavage. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So we potentially think that that's the ancestral mechanisms. And mm -hmm. within Sparellians, unequal cleavage is, is not really that common. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when you see other Sparellians, most of them have equal cleaving. Um, so uh, unequal is mostly the rare. And now we think uh, that potentially equal cleavage is, is the mechanism that is happening ancestrally for analysts. Um, but there's something, another story also that we're trying to reconstruct more with more effective tools as well uh, mm -hmm. to have an ancestral character reconstruction. That's really helpful. Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, this is the sort of thing where we have to, you know, turn the wheel as we get more and more tax on sampling, especially mm -hmm. for Spirelia. So we have a question from Brad who says, nice talk, Bradley Davidson, it's worth more. Did your analysis of the Owenia transcriptome reveal any other changes in our understanding of what signaling pathway components or transcription factors are ancestral to Spiralia? Mm, right now, yeah, according was the biggest surprise. So we we focus on that and that led us to try to look at the transcription of the rest of the analysts. But the lab in general is working in comparative genomics of a lot of analysts, including deep sea. And in that case, uh, some of my colleagues that have found losses of important mechanisms that are happening in deep sea analytics. But in Owenia per se, uh, everything seems to be very complete. Um, so that's, that's great for us. Um, yeah. Great. 